Hello, everyone. I am super excited to be moderating this panel, which will be a conversation with the city. My name again is Lady Breon, and I serve as the executive director of the Black Arts District. I'm also a spoken word poet, and I'm proud to say that Baltimore just won two national poetry slams, the Women of the World Poetry Slam and the International Poetry Slam, which is a team slam. So in the spirit of Baltimore's recent success and celebrating National Poetry Month, which is ending today, I thought I'd start this panel with a poem. So I'm going to read an original piece called Two Baltimore's. Baltimore is like a set of fraternal twins, conceived as one, but birthed into two, separated by a difference in characteristics. Don't believe me? Well, check the census, cause half these neighborhoods been black and poor since Nixon was president and is crazy. In 68, they put a bullet through a king's dream and in the streets were riots. 2015, a gray man is made a memory and again, riots because America is still on a predominantly dark meat diet in this city. There are multi-climate conditions, concrete jungles, food deserts, fire hydrants are misting while resources run low. But behold, an oasis of plush green trees and rolling parks exist in the land of condos. Just look at the windows if you want to see pain. The rich no curtains, cause they would never cover. The poor use brown plywood as a cover and you can hear the cricket field silence or police sirens bouncing off the walls of project housing, mansions in Guilford, but vacants in Gilmore, manicured lawns or weeds growing between the cracks of callous sidewalks, it's 2 a.m. And on one side of town, there was a white woman jogging a taut leash around the neck of her miniature schnauzer. Sophie. And on the other side of town, there are blue lights, cop lights, floodlights, cell phone lights in the hand of a young brother on the corner trapping while the low light of hope is ever dimming. And John Hopkins medical campus is forever sprouting, touting, revitalization, smiling through crest white teeth while the rotting teeth of the poor can feel the ache of gentrification in their dilapidated communities, decaying like cavities. But Coffee cafes foreshadow a root canal for pennies. They'll uproot a mother, father, and child, then put colorful paint over a graveyard view. Just ask Greenmount what a station north will do. Lead particles in the H2O or outdoor water fountains always afloat. Bike lanes or crater moon-sized potholes. Fiends penguin wobble to a street side lean or prescription addicts with paychecks that keep habits fully functioning. There are some communities with flower shops, but others have teddy bear memorials commemorating homies that got popped, tennis shoes on light poles to uplift fallen souls. Still can't make the distinction between two twins cocooned in the womb of the belly of the beast. It's easy as counting one, two, three. Just count the corner stores, liquor stores, and churches versus dog parks, guarded fences, and organic markets. The tale of two Baltimores is not a secret, but there are some who are too privileged to ever see it. Thank you so much. Again, that was an original poem called Two Baltimores. So I'm going to switch hats now. So that was my poetry hat. I'm putting on my executive director and moderator hat now. All right, y'all see the shift? Okay, all right, new hat. So now we're gonna get this thing started. With my moderator hat, I wanna read the opening statement that is intended to ground every conversation that we are gonna have as a part of the Black Artist Fair. So here is that opening statement. Welcome to the Black Artist Fair presented by Comcast and the Black Arts District. The Black Artist Fair is designed to connect Black creatives from the greater Baltimore area to resources and services to further enhance their crafts and their creative practices. We recognize that often Black creatives have less opportunities to develop throughout their career careers. This space has been curated to provide quality opportunities for growth, to challenge the ways racism, white supremacy has impacted Baltimore's creative community and to develop strategies to make Baltimore a more culturally equitable space. So we invite you to network, to question, to challenge, to listen for understanding, and most importantly, to build with us. Thank you and welcome to a conversation with the city. 
All right, so we're gonna um, invite our panelists up in just a second, but um, we, unfortunately, uh, we were supposed to have Mayor Scott with us on the panel, but since he can no longer be with us, we decided to ask him to respond to some of the questions that we will ask our other panelists. And so we're gonna start this by queuing up a video from our very own Mayor Scott. Hey everybody, it's Mayor Brandon Scott, and I'm so excited to join you all virtually uh, for the Black Artist Fair's conversation with the city, and I look forward to answering some of the questions that you have. When it comes to making our city a more culturally equitable place, uh, my commitment is unwavering. I'm rooted in the practice of supporting a Baltimore where arts and culture is fully embedded into public life. Uh, we know that it's imperative to the growth and success of our residents and uh, should be available to everyone. I'm dedicated to ensuring that all of our residents have equitable opportunities and access to arts and culture here in Baltimore. Upon uh, assuming office, I convened the Arts and Culture Transition Committee of local artists across the city who know what resources and art communities and creatives need. Uh, they put together a robust report and we are currently looking at ways to implement their suggestions and findings. We also have BOPA uh, and, and their work uh, as they work tirelessly to support our art communities and represent our artistic and cultural history in the city through programming and other initiatives. Lastly. Uh, I would just add to that that we know that Baltimore has not specifically uh, been looking out for black artists and creators and uh, that's a task that I am ready to take on and we look forward to working uh, with our black creators and artists to make Baltimore a city where they can not only just survive and thrive in great ways. Uh, this one is simple. Continue to do what you do, advocate and show up for the arts. I want our creators to know that I'm listening. I want you to know that we're gonna be working with you. We are who we are due to the rich, uh, unique culture. And it is up to us to not just preserve, but to pass down and better that culture for future generations. I am here as a partner and support system for you all and look forward to making a Baltimore a more vibrant city together because we know uh, we would not be Baltimore without uh, the efforts and work and all the things that black artists and creators have done in our city throughout the years. All right. That was our uh, some remarks from our mayor, and I, I want to thank Mayor Scott for taking the time to make that video, even though he was not able to be with us today. Um, and I'm also thankful for the Arts and Culture Transition Committee um, that Mayor Scott mentioned, which I had the esteemed pleasure to be a part of, as well as so many other amazing creatives um, in the city. And I'm hopeful that some of the recommendations um, will actually be realized to help to move Baltimore forward, especially for the creative community. And so with that being said, I want to go ahead and invite our panelists up. So we have three panelists. Um, Dr. Santalisa is running a bit late. She will be joining us soon. But I do want to take a second and go ahead and introduce the panelists that we have so far. Um, so I'm going to let you all introduce yourself. Jackie, if we could start with you, just take two minutes or less and tell the audience a little bit about yourself. And um, yeah, we'll start with that. Awesome. Well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And first, congratulations, Lady Brian, on this amazing first for you. Um, this is spectacular. I'm so proud to see this finally come into fruition and to light for you. I am Jackie Downs. I'm the director of the Arts Council for Baltimore City, um, and I work for both of the Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts. I have been in my position for just over two years now, and I'm super excited to be talking to you all today. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Next up, Jacia Smith. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and the agency that you represent. 
Good afternoon, and thank you all for having us here. My name is Jacia Smith, and I'm the Chief of Staff for Baltimore City Recreation and Parks. So we are the city agency uh, in charge of um, recreation and cultural arts and uh, green spaces in the city. So um, as the Chief of Staff, I help the director lay out that vision to ensure uh, we make ourselves available to the citizens of Baltimore. So we're excited to be here and uh, engage in this conversation. Awesome. Well, again, I want to thank both of you for joining us. And like I said, folks, once Dr. Santelisis, who's running a little bit behind, joins us, we're going to fold her right into the conversation and keep things moving. So um, I, I want to start you all with some of the same conversations or questions, rather, that we gave Mayor Scott. And so if we could start by answering our first question, which is, what is your agency's commitment toward making Baltimore a more culturally equitable city. What is your agency's commitment toward making Baltimore a more culturally equitable city? Um, so I am going to throw it to you first, Jacia. Um, and yeah, we'll start with you. Sure. So, um, you know, equity is one of the, the major underpinnings of everything that we do in recreation and parks. And I think for most people, when they think about recreation and parks, they think about our rec centers. They think about young people playing, um, being involved in, in athletics. Right. And that is a large part of what we do. But we also do a lot in the cultural arts. Right. So we provide programming for dance, for spoken word, uh, for uh, music and beat making. So one of the things that we um, are working to prop up and to make sure we have the proper support is growing our cultural arts program. Uh, we just recently reopened our Cahill Rec Center, and that's the focus of that space. So there is a, a full lighting system, a stage, and, you know, the plans for that space are going to be amazing. You know, we've been talking about dinner theater and plays and spoken word contests. So one of the things that uh, we have been doing is to let the city know how much we have to offer. Um, so, you know, Baltimore City Recreation and Parks is in the middle of a, a rebirth, right? So we are working very diligently to bring new people into our space, to re-engage the people who've always been with us, but to know that there is literally something for everybody. And we serve not just young people, we serve seniors, we serve uh, therapeutic recs, so those are our residents that have uh, learning disabilities. So what we do in the arts is important because for some people, we're the only outlet, the only place they will ever paint. Or, or, or do any visual arts, the only place that they will be able to invite their families for a play. So for us, we wanna make sure those programs are available throughout the entire city. So growing um, our cadre of vendors and people who can help us offer these services, uh, training up our staff so that we can offer those services ourselves. So for us, our commitment to equity is making sure that the programming um, that is reflective of our community is available in all of our spaces, so in our green spaces and our rec centers. So uh, we're really working really diligently to increase our programming, particularly as it relates to the arts. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very robust answer. Uh, all right, Jackie, um, you are up, and then I will circle back to Dr. Santelises. Thank you for joining us. All right, Jackie, so again, the question is, what is your agency's commitment toward making Baltimore a more culturally equitable city? Awesome. So awesome question. And first, I'd like to also clarify for the viewers out there. I know Brian knows, but um, I find that with BOPA, there's a lot of miscommunication about who we are and what we do. So we are first not a city agency. We are a 501c3 nonprofit and we have close city ties. So we are a nonprofit, which means we do fundraise for a lot of the activities that we are mostly known for. Um, when you think of BOPA, most people think of Light City, Artscape, the MLK Parade. Um, but as the designated arts council for the city, we are also responsible for a lot of the arts and culture programming that happens throughout the city. So our responsibility is to the entire city of Baltimore and we have made tons of commitments um, moving forward um, and currently just to make the city more equitable. Specifically speaking, our programming. Um, we really want to create and cultivate programming that speaks to um, the entirety of Baltimore City and specifically to underserved populations and communities and artists who don't identify themselves as artists or creatives per se. We have a program now that we are implementing called the Business of Arts Professional Development Networking Program series, which was specifically designed to cater to um, artists and creatives who don't have the means to go to an MFA program, who don't have the means to pay for a master class. So in our thinking, we really wanted to create a program that was accessible to all and equitable so we can provide information um, in terms of technical supports and funding resources to people to keep them in this city. I am a native New Yorker, right? I love the city, um, but I don't want people from Baltimore City to think that you have to leave here to make it anywhere. 
there is a plethora, overwhelming pool of talent in this city. And I feel it's Baltimore City's responsibility in order to retain and keep them here. We need to do a better job at providing them with the resources um, to keep them professionalizing in their craft and their field, to give them the tools and the knowledge um, to make their make their claim in their field, per se, no matter what discipline you're in. So the, the professional development, the business of arts, um, networking series is a program that we've designed specifically for that to make it more equitable across the board for all artists of every discipline to have knowledge and support in terms of developing their craft. Uh, we also have a ton of grant opportunities that we're providing for the city for small organizations, large organizations, um, organizations that specifically focus on communities in need, communities in, communities of color. Um, you can check out our website and I can go into them more deeply about what those programs are. But we are committed, um, as the mayor said as well, um, to making, um, to providing resources and to provide them equitably to everyone in Baltimore City um, so we all have the same access to the type of resources available. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jackie. All right. So, Dr. Santelisa, thank you again for joining us. I want to take a second and allow you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your role as a city leader. Great, thank you, and then my apologies for being a little late, uh, but I am Sonia Santelisis, the CEO of Baltimore City Public Schools, and um, I have the pleasure and privilege of leading uh, Baltimore City's public schools, all 170 of them. So um, it's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to have a focus on the arts, and Black arts in particular. All right. So perfect. So the question that we were just talking about is what is your agency? So talking about the school system's commitment toward making Baltimore a more culturally equitable city. No, it's a great question and one that we've been really focusing on the last few years as we've really honed in on student wholeness. And one of the ways that we really um, decided to go deeply with, with wholeness was to realize that we needed to expand and make sure that students across the city, regardless of the school they intended, had equitable access to the arts. And you know, it was patchy. It depended on which school you went to, which neighborhood you were in. So one of the things that we've done is we have partnered uh, with many leaders in the arts community to put together um, a longer term uh, city schools arts plan. And what that has done is it has really increased, for example, the number of full-time arts teachers that we now have in Baltimore City Schools. So we have been adding each year, um, making sure that our young people have access um, to certified arts teachers. The other thing that we've done um, which is the beautiful thing about Baltimore that I think sets us apart as a city is really the partnerships between the arts community and city schools. So we have a lot of partners who have come in and actually um, partnered alongside teachers, partnered alongside our schools. Um, and within our equity mapping, which is what we um, do to really uh, hold a mirror up to ourselves and say, are we providing equitable access across the city and how do we build towards that? What we're seeing is those places um, where we really need to uh, make even further investment. But, but one of the pieces that I think is really um, exciting is that we now have in, in far more schools, and I'd say all schools, like that, that place for young people to have access to different materials, to have access um, to different kinds of art mediums. Um, we're not totally where we, where we want to be, clearly, um, but the progress we've made over the last, um, last few years, having more targeted professional development, um, and we even added more kind of central support. So the real focus is how do we make sure um, that young people get early exposure to the arts because that's what's going to feed, continue to feed the pipeline of artists that we have in Baltimore City. Awesome, thank you so much um, for that thorough answer. I really do appreciate it. All right, so let's move into the next question. We have talked a lot about your different agencies' commitment to making Baltimore overall more culturally equitable. 
we, you know, are connected to a number of black creatives all across Baltimore. And I'm curious, how can we as black creatives support your agency in making Baltimore more vi vibrant and thriving? Like what can we do on our side to support the efforts that you all have mentioned? And so Jackie, can we start with you? Sure, I would say connection is key and having dialogue just like this. Um, I am so open to having conversations and meetings with any and everyone. If you know me, I want to talk and we can collaborate. So whenever we have programming or any events going on or just ideas, um, shoot me email, I can connect with you. If we're having events, I'd love to um, be able to come to your platform, promote our events so you can spread the word out to people that we may not be reaching um, and vice versa. If we're having an event, you can come to our platform to promote yours. It's all about networking and open communication. Um, and it also goes for questions as well. If there are questions about specific grant opportunities that we're offering or specific grant opportunities that we are not offering that you would like us to see, that you would like to see, um, I think dialogue is key. And, and I think for people to know that that window of communication is always open at BOPA, especially with the Arts Council. Thank you so much. All right, uh, let's go to you, Jacia. Well, how can we support the efforts that are happening at recreation and parks? So I think for us, we talked about how, you know, one of the big things that we do was that we engage with young people, right? So uh, the more we can get uh, black creatives in our spaces so they can engage with our young people and just some having thought partnership around how we can continue to grow that space, right? So um, as we are propping up different programs, we really need um, these black creatives in our spaces with our young people to make it a reality for them, right? So, you know, we have the pleasure to deal with young people when they're starting to discover themselves, when they're starting to discover their hidden talents um, and having vendors that can come in and that can teach the classes, that can help us with our production. So what we really need is partnership, right? So we, um, at various points, we make dip calls for vendors, for people to actually come in and offer their services and to teach classes and to do programs with us. So what we really need is, um, I think, some intentional partnerships, particularly on our spaces that have that focus. So Cahill, Hill, if you haven't visited, it's an amazing and beautiful facility. It has a state-of-the-art theater. Again, I'm going to keep plugging it. But we would love to have creatives that come and help us make that space come alive, right? To help us as we're thinking through the productions that we have there, as we're thinking about um, conversations and new poets and new and new artists, right? We need you all to come into our spaces and to partner with us. And sometimes the connections are not always clear as they could be, right? So we we know that the back, the black creative space is here. We see it. Um, it's not always that we can connect those dots. So sometimes we do need people to come to us and say, hey, have you considered, right? So one thing I think uh, I hope resonates that we are open to the thought partnership and there are no limits to the possibilities, right? We are in contact with some local artists now and we're working on a, a mural for one of our buildings, right? And that came as a suggestion from that group. So we're open. Um, we are being bold and, and trying new things and being bold in how we reimagine recreation and how that shows up in our city. Um, so we really need partnerships. So I, I would, success would look like after this conference, our email is like buzzing uh, with creatives who are saying, hey, I have an idea. I have something I want to try because, you know, the possibilities are endless. We really are in a space where we are just open to reimagine and rethink all the things that we've done, acknowledging things that we may not have done greatly in the past. Right. And trying to figure out how we can support the community because we need to make sure that the next generation of black creatives are being nurtured, that they have the right supplies, they're aware of the, the best techniques, right? So we do need some support in that regard. So that's what it will look like for us. We we need partnership. Sounds good. I'm going to hold you to it, okay? The Black Arts District is, is looking for spaces to do new awesome things, okay? We got a whole host of artists. Y'all got a state-of-the-art space. We got state-of-the-art artists, okay? So I'm going to hold you to it. Um, so now you, you got to hold it to us. We are, we are camera now. We on camera. We live. Okay. Um, all right, Dr. Santelisa, same question. Um, how can Black creatives support the vision and commitment that you have just talked about um, for making Baltimore more culturally equitable? So I think one of the things that we have seen over and over again is when our young people, when our students get access to black creatives, right? Those artists that are where they hope to be or aspire to be, people from their neighborhoods, people that look like them. It really is an inspiration that you, you know, you can't equal 
only through a curriculum. I think we've got a number of ways that we have already been um, linking in with uh, some of the, you know, the black creatives within the city. Um, our young people get excited when they get to interview people like Devin Allen, right, as part of um, their curriculum and our Be More Me curriculum, which is really centered around um, the richness of Baltimore City, right? It was, we created it, teachers did, um, in response to countering some of the negative, broader narrative about Baltimore. And so that gives lots of opportunities for Black creatives in the city of Baltimore to be part of that. Like we have a citywide um, arts fair virtually, right, that our young people are putting on. And, and I can't emphasize enough that, the, you know, the difference when our young people get to actually interact with those that are older than them, those that have gone before them, those that are in the work now, it's just a different level of support, a different level of affirmation, not only of their own creativity, but the creativity of their community and the creativity of Baltimore. So we have a lot of different opportunities throughout the year. We've been building them and really just want to encourage Black creatives in Baltimore to be part of the actual learning that young people do. Thank you. I have a couple of follow up questions and then we have a question from the audience. So um, based on what you were just talking about, Dr. Santelisis, I, I think about myself and a number of other teaching artists, right, that I know all across Baltimore City, those master community artists, right, who may or may not have formal training, but have years and years of experience. So when you talk about having more opportunities for young people to see artists who look like them, to work with artists who look like them from their community or have similar experience, right? To be able to interview the, the Devin Allens of the world. I'm curious, um, is there a plan for uh, city schools to decrease some of the barriers that exist from allowing those community artists to have more meaningful teaching opportunities, right? Because we may not have the MFAs, right? We may not have gone through some kind of pipeline that would allow you to have the credits to make you a core curriculum kind of art teacher, right? But we have the experience, we have the know-how, we have the connection, all the things. And so I'm curious, is there any plan to kind of break down some of those barriers that I've heard a number of teaching artists talk about? No, and it is, it is absolutely real. And we have similar challenges in our CTE fields, right? So, you know, if you are a fabulous um, construction uh you know, genius or professional, right? It's much harder, right, to get certified in the kind of traditional education system in part because those are state mandates, right? So we've advocated um, continually, at least since I've been here and probably a little before, we have advocated hard for there to be alternative pathways to teaching, for there to be um, different ways of demonstrating experience. And so that a lot of that is controlled at the state level. And we've been really advocating on that end. I think what we can do now, and I think part of why we built our, our arts plan and our arts team, um, you know, Chanel is amazing. Um, what we have tried to do is build opportunities and experiences that don't require the formal certification, right? And so one of the things that I think is a great time and a place to partner even now is, you know, all this talk about educational recovery and what young people have been through over the last year um, and with additional federal funds, one of the things that we're able to do now is actually create more of those experiences after school, right? Create those experiences over summer because in in those settings, we don't have some of the same restrictions that the state holds us to for, for kind of formal degrees. And it's one of the things we're, we're going to be holding um, over the next, I'd say, four to six weeks. We're going to be holding community feedback sessions and input sessions. And it would be great to hear from Black creatives and some of the organizations represented here to say, hey, these are the ways we think we could do that. And now that we have 
frankly, a little more space. It's one-time funding, but it gives us a little more space to say, what are some of the things we wanted to do to bring more Black creatives, bring more of the Black arts community in Baltimore together, frankly, in more creative ways. I mean, no, more non-traditional ways. So we're trying to work on both ends, both the advocacy end um, at the state level, but also to use kind of summer after school, non-traditional spaces of teaching to help kind of bridge that connection. Gotcha. Thank you so much. And uh, we'd love to share out um, the information about your listening session so we can make sure um, that folks who definitely want to comment on that process and, and give their feedback are able to participate. So thank you for that. Jackie, a uh, follow-up question for you. You mentioned that uh, BOPA serves as you know uh, uh, the Arts Council for Baltimore. Um, and from what I understand, um, this, is, this is kind of a new role so to speak, not that BOPA has not been been taking on that role since its existence, but there's a more um, emphasis on, on, on serving in that role as, as other arts councils have done for other municipalities. So can you talk about what it means for BOPA to, to be Baltimore's art council, um, just for folks who, who don't know what that means? Unmuted, sure. So I like to say, um, as I said, I've been at BOPA for two years, and but Bo I would like to say that um, the festivals of BOPA have been the face, but the Arts Council work is the soul of who we are. And upon my arrival, I met some amazing people who were doing some awesome things. Yes, I knew about the large scale festivals and they're pretty cool and fancy and I miss them and can't wait for them to come back. Um, but I was um, more so impressed with my community arts manager and my public art you know, supervisor, all the people who were doing this this real core community driven work. Um, so it's not that we are now taking a turn. I think we're now being highlighted more and the focus, um, the inward communication about what BOPA is doing is now being focused on the Arts Council, which I'm absolutely proud, um, proud of because I think it's the sole work of BOPA. I think that a lot of people don't know a lot of the work that is done in communities and how we're committed to working with different organizations and really being a representative for um, communities, making sure that public art, community art are in areas of blight. Um, there are so many areas. I was talking to someone on my team this morning. Um, we were talking about how there are some areas still not covered in the AD districts that have no art at all. <laughs> like no public art, no community art at all. That's a problem in Baltimore City. So how do we challenge them? How do we serve them? How do we ensure that those people are not being left out and being spoken for? Um, you know, talking to funders, uh, making sure that they understand the commitment. The conversation now, everyone knows, is how to support Black creatives in the city. That's a national conversation that's happening now. But making sure that they understand that, you know, multi-year commitments are real. That's something that people are expecting from you now. You can't just do a one-off and think that, that you're good. You have to show that you're really invested. And you have to show your true commitment to Baltimore City. So the work that we do, we spend um, a lot of my resources and time goes to um, providing individual supports to individual organizations through funding and also to artists, um, individual artists through project support as well and providing um, technical support and funding opportunities. So we have maybe anywhere from five to seven, maybe with eight grant opportunities that are offered throughout the year. We have a few that are going on now. Um, so I think the focus for, for BOPA is to really spread the word because I often speak to somebody once a week who asks the question, what do you do? Uh, <laughs> you know, if you're not having a festival, what is the focus? I didn't know you do audit work. That's a five week apprenticeship summer program that specifically serves um, underserved at risk youth um, with youth works and we teach them um, how to do mural, mural work, pairing them up with an amazing apprentice, or amazing master of community artist in Baltimore City. That happens every year. We've been doing that for years. Or our community arts grants where we make sure that communities have input in the type of art that's coming into their community. So it's not just art for art's sake. We are making sure that there is input and buy-in. So there are tons of different programs that we have consistently done over the years that I think a lot of people are not aware of and that I think BOPA can absolutely do. And we are doing a better job of messaging and getting that out. In terms of making it more equitable, I think um, that's a constant conversation. I'm glad that the country's on fire now that after this racial you know, reckoning that's happening and cultural enlightening. I think for us, it's a constant um, learning 
you know, always engaging in conversation with people and understanding what the needs are, what the want is. And from my end, I think a few things that we're doing differently now, um, just trying to make sure things are equitable um, in terms of our grants, ensuring that the people who are panel reviewing, who are reviewing the applications, they're reflective of Baltimore City. So I think it really is, is important that if we're having artist grants, there are artists who are on the, 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 the panel to make sure that we are asking the right questions first in our applications. And then second, they're the ones screening all the applications coming through. And then on the flip side, for people who are not familiar with applying for grants, or if you are familiar with applying for grants, making sure the application process is not so tedious. That's been a feedback and criticism that I've heard time and time again. So now our newest grant opportunity that we have out now, the Community Thrive Grant, which is for smaller organizations with operating grants for 200,000 or less, we do now have options where you can submit video submissions to your answers. You don't have to do a tedious, you know, two page summary on your proposal, what you're doing. Not all questions have that video option, but some do. And that's just one of the ways we're trying to make it more accessible to people who answer questions. You know, if they're looking at applications on their phones, there are tons of organizations who are so well adverse and adept to answering questions for grants. And that's their world. And they have grant writers and grant teams to do it. And there are so many who don't have it. So we want to make it fair to everyone. So let's just make this process a little bit easier. And we're testing it out. We're seeing how it goes because we're constantly trying to make things more equitable. We want to see applications from people who've never applied to a grant before. Those are the folks we want. You don't have to be perfect. And, and the best way to message that is to make the grants more accessible. So that's kind of what my world is consumed with right now. I love it. It's hard work. <laughs> um, it's a lot of communication. It's a lot of give and take. It's a lot of research and listening um, from our end. But I think Baltimore deserves it. And we are on the path to making sure that um, everyone is heard and we're responsive and communicative to people who are in need of funding and who want to provide something for Baltimore City. Yeah. And just for context, really quickly, Jackie, um, you mentioned y'all have about eight different kinds of grants. What's the range? Um, amount of, of, of the grants that you all offer? Yes, right now we have anywhere from $500, um, $500 to um, Baltimore Creatives for Professional Development Mini Grants that we just awarded a couple of months ago, all the way up to $10,000 um, for Community Arts, uh, our Communities Thrive organizational grants. And then we have prize competitions where um, visual artists can receive a $25,000 award for visual artists in Baltimore City. So there's a wide range um, and we're always looking at different funders and also talking to the community to find out what the needs are. So I would say from 500 to 10,000. Perfect. Thank you so much. And that's just for everyone who's listening. Make sure y'all are checking out BOPA's website, social media, everything to, to make sure you're connected and learning about the different funding opportunities that are made for you all. All right. To see if my question is... Um, in reference to, if we go back to your previous answer about wanting a connection with Black Creators for Thought Partnership, um, for, uh, you, you know, doing events and et cetera, one of the complaints, if you will, that I've heard from folks is that it is difficult to navigate city portals and processes and all the things to be able to connect, even if you have a great idea, a great project, you, you have all the things. It's like, how do I actually connect with the city to be able to support me in the thing that I want to do in my community, right? Or, or, or for, for the kids on my block, right? So can you talk a little bit about if, if the goal is to connect and partner, is it any, is it any advice or, or things that y'all are working on um, on the city side to make it easier to navigate actually making that connection? Absolutely. That's a very good question. Um, our director has been in the agency now for almost four years. Uh, one of the first things that um, he noticed when he got here is that we did not have clear lines of communicating with the, with the community. Um, so out of that uh, frustration was birthed our new community engagement and strategic partnerships team. So we have an actual team who is dedicated to connecting with communities. Uh, we have about a six uh, member staff, and that's the place that you can go to to navigate Baltimore City Recreation and Parks, right? So that's the space where you can start. We, we don't want our constituents, we don't want the residents to be confused anymore. We want them to have access to our processes, to our buildings, to our spaces, and we recognize that that had not always been easy. So now through our community engagement and strategic partnership teams, there's liaisons that are assigned there that know if you have a question about uh, want to have an art installation in Patterson Park, they can walk you through that process. If you uh, have a concern that um, there's something happening in that space, 
you use the liaisons to kind of navigate our system. So it should be much easier. And um, as it relates to programming, um, we have a new programming division as well, too, because how do we get new programs? How do new um, how do artists come with new ideas on how they want to engage with us? So our programming team is their job to generate ideas, um, to engage with new vendors and uh, teaching artists, as you mentioned earlier. So those two new divisions are how our agency is reimagining how we communicate. And we want to be very responsive to the community too, right? So um, you start off by saying it's a critique. We love critiques, right? So uh, we are very open to constructive feedback. Uh, we understand that we are an agency on a rise, right? So we are overcoming challenges that we had in the past, um, but we are very committed to making sure that our best selves is experienced by everybody, right? So um, we're not ashamed when we don't get it right, right? So we're not, you know, our ego is fine, right? We are learning um, and we're learning it through partnership. We're learning it to uh, touching back to the community. One of the things we're really focused on is community engagement. We don't want to have programming for programming's sake. We want to know what type of program each community wants. Recognizing that Baltimore is a collection of neighborhoods, a collection of communities with very unique needs, right? So we want to make sure that the program we offer, the arts that are that are offered, right? In some spaces, it may be visual arts and others, it may be performing arts, right? So we do want to make sure we're being reflect, um, reflective with the communities that we serve. So through both our community engagement team and our programming team, uh, we are reaching back to the people we serve to figure out what they need. So those are the two avenues. And, you know, our website, um, bcrp.baltimorecity.gov, our uh, social media channels, Wreck and Parks, um, all the information, we're just trying to do a really good job of making sure we are getting the information out there so that people can follow us and kind of be more in tune to the day-to-day -day things that are happening in the agency. And there's somebody who's monitoring our social media channels. So if you have an issue, if you tag us in it, we'll respond and we'll help you navigate through those channels. So we know that city government can be complicated, but we're trying to make it as, as less clunky as we can. Yeah, so I saw a comment from one of our lovely board members, Kenesha, and she asked if you could say one more time uh, the how, how people can connect. So I, I know you mentioned your um, social media and a website. Can you just say it one more time so folks can hear it um, and hopefully somebody can uh, repost it in the chat yeah. team? <laughs> so our website, we're at bcrp.baltimorecity.gov. And on social, we are at Rick and Park. So um, you can find us there. We're very active, very responsive. Um, so we want to make it as easy as we can. So if you tag us, we'll, we'll respond. If you DM us, we'll respond. Uh, we want to be responding real time, too. We're, we're really trying to work on um, our customer service and our response time. So And we want you to hold us accountable. Uh, we, we're going to be our best selves when we realize how we can continue to be better and reaching back to the community, hearing from you all and making sure we're being responsive to your needs is how we're going to get there. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So I could ask questions all day, I promise. But I want to take a second and get some of the questions that we are getting off of social media. So for those of you who are listening on Facebook or those of you who are listening on YouTube, please comment your questions. We're going to take some time and get to your questions. So let's queue up our first question. All right. From Christopher, does your street performance licenses allow you to perform anywhere on the streets of Baltimore? Do you still need to audition and compete for time slots in order to perform in the gallery amphitheater downtown? Far too often, those slots are taken up by people not from, I'm guessing, Baltimore. Oh, not from the area. And the chosen performers have little diversity. Great question, Christopher. I'm guessing this is maybe directed to Rex and Parks, but also maybe Bopa, you can chime in about the um, street performing licenses, maybe. So I, I don't have uh, information on the street performing licenses. I'm not certain that those uh, come from our agency. I don't believe that's a permit that we offer. It may be through another city agency, um, but we can definitely take back some feedback if there's concerns about the current process. I'm not particularly certain that our agency is the, is the one who's in charge of that. Yes, and BOPA, we're not a licensing agency at all. We don't have permission to um, give licenses to individuals. The only the only department within both that actually does have that responsibility is uh, the department for film because they do film licensing when people come to the city and shoot. But as far as our events and stuff, we don't have the permission. Um, but I can say that BOPA is actively working now because there is so much miscommunication around who to comment, who to contact about what type of art, um, excuse me, what type of license for what type of event. Um, that is a regular conversation and I have heard that concern um, several times. 
we're in active conversation now with the A&E districts and with um, the Department of Planning to figure out some things. And we're hopefully trying to get those things morally, more fleshed out so it's clear as to, you know, timelines, fees. We're also trying to get fees reduced as well. But we are not the office that administers the permits for individuals or organizations. Thank you for clarifying. And I want to also say um, you are not the only one uh, who has been asking about street performance licensing. It, it is one of those complicated processes, right? With a whole lot of fees that may be a little unnecessary. Um, <laughs> so uh, we at the Black Arts District, and I know some of the other arts districts uh, are also committed to helping to, to make the permitting process as transparent as possible. But I know for us at the Black Arts District, we're really trying to think about how we can um, make it easier, at least in our district, to get those uh, licenses to perform on the streets. I know the more attractive places are downtown, amphitheater, like you mentioned, um, but we love street performances all across the city. And so hopefully um, we can we can start talking about how we can get folks all around the city in all of the arts districts and not just the downtown business district. All right, next question. Another question from Christopher, where can artists receive help developing grant writing or 501c3 creation techniques? Well, first of all, before I throw this out to our panelists, I hope that you signed up for the grant writing workshop that we are having as a part of the Black Artist Fair. Shameless plug. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in on that question? <laughs> yes, I'll jump in. So we... Um, there are tons of organizations here that offer that type of professional development support. You can actually check us out in a few months. I know we're offering a grant writing specialty. The focus for the business of this month is the art of finance. We're talking all about, we're getting all up in your finances, how to create a budget, <laughs> how to open up a bank account, how to support your dream funding project. But I know in the next few months, the focus will be grant writing. I also know that, um, uh, we do grant writing workshops for a ton of different organizations around the city. I know Motorhouse, they, I just recently worked with them and they have an amazing program where they offer these professional development supports quarterly um, to some of their participants and people who are um, affiliated with their program. There are tons of organizations that do it. Um, I know we are doing one coming up soon, but um, yeah, just check it out. I would type in Google grant writing support um, in Baltimore, and I'm sure you'll find a ton of resources that pop up. But you can check us out too. You can contact me directly, and I can follow up with you as well for more information. I would also um, say uh, your local library, check out Enoch Pratt Free Library. They have all kind of classes um, for both grant writing and um, creating a, a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. Um, I've actually attended some. They're, they're, they're free and most of the time, um, and they're super informative. So um, you can start at the main branch and probably find a lot of resources there as well. So thank you for that question. Do we have any other questions? All right, Christopher says, what are some ways in which the school system is providing paid teaching opportunities to the many artists in Baltimore who may have not finished traditional education, but will provide great resources for students. And so we talked a little bit about this um, for the school system. I would say if you have anything to um, offer additionally, Dr. Santelises, that would be great. But I'm curious if there are any opportunities that maybe um, Jackie Bopa is offering for um, teaching artists, right? Because I know, you know, as an arts agency, there are opportunities outside of the school system proper um, or Rex and Parks. We talk about partnerships. So are there any opportunities that either the other two agencies are providing as well? I would say stay tuned. Um, stay tuned because we are working now trying to figure out how we're going to approach arts education um, for the next coming school year. Right now, we currently fund different organizations who fund teaching artists which is the best way for us to provide support to Baltimore City um, teaching artists. We'll probably continue that again um, in the next few months for the next coming up um, school year. So stay tuned. We will have grant opportunities um, for organizations, possibly individuals as well, but we were trying to support organizations who support teaching artists. So we'll definitely be offering that again for the fiscal year 2022. And, and for Rec and Park, so yes, so uh, we we contract with different vendors 
who are able to offer us, you know, six to eight week programs for our young people. So if you have, uh, if you teach poetry, um, there's an opportunity to bring that there, visual arts, dance. I mean, you name it. Yes. So we are, we do have paid opportunities for that. Um, it's not for free. We know that the work that you all do are very, is very important. So yes, those opportunities are available in Reckon Parks. We're actually building out um, what we'll be doing for the fall. So we're working on fall programming now. So um, in short order, there should be some information shared on our uh, social channels about when we're inviting people to tell us what types of things they could offer in our recreation center. So stay tuned. All right, thank you. Do we have any other questions? No? Okay, so I will jump back into some questions that I have for you all and we'll keep this thing going. If there are other questions, again, if you're listening on social media, Facebook, YouTube, what have you, please type your questions in the comments and we will ask our city agency leaders. All right. Um, so this question is, let's start uh, with Jasia. Um, so I know if I go back in some of your comments before, you mentioned that Rex and Parks is, you know, on the rise, right? And overcoming, you know, past issues and et cetera. So this question is kind of uh, framed around that. How has, how would you say that uh, Recreations and Parks has positively impacted the Black creative community historically, but what are also some ways that you could have been more impactful based on, you know, this past that we've been talking about? Yeah, sure. So I, I do think that we have given artists space to uh, to come in, right? To to use our spaces to engage with young people. Uh, we do have different uh, visual arts and murals that exist in our space. So there has, but there is a history of us working with the Black creatives in Baltimore. I do think um, having more defined programs again that um, artists know how to access, how to get into it. Um, and making sure that there's uh, proper resources there, right? So if we're going to do murals and it, you know, costs X amount of dollars to to buy the paint and make sure we have those things and understand the needs and the supplies that are necessary there. So one area I think we can um, improve on is is the pipeline, right? How do we get new artists into our space? What does that rotation look like? Um, when we're exploring doing murals and different things in our spaces, do we redo them every five years or do we let them stay for ten years? So having some real um, intentionality about what that cycle looks like, what's the cadence, and how often do we go to the community to get uh, fresh input and to to tap back into it. Um, so now with our, our programming division and a specific emphasis on the arts, right, I think we're better positioned now to actually have those conversations and figure out what makes sense, right? So um, we know that BOPA is really the entity who does murals and Baltimore is a beautiful city. It is very colorful, um, but we have inside of buildings that we could use as, as spaces for our young people to, to express themselves and to make their recreation centers their own. But not just that, right? There's different um, areas that we can engage and showcase our um, Black creatives better. So I think that's a space where we could do, how do we connect? And then how do we showcase? Like, how do we make it so that there are much more um, opportunities for artists to come together and to display the wonderful and amazing things that we do? So we do that in different um, um, arenas, like Aframe is a space where uh, we have carved out for that type of stuff. But doing it much more regularly and having a, a understand cadence about what when does it make sense to come back and when does it make sense to, to re-engage? So those are the things that we could do a better job on that working towards. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so my next question um, is for you, Dr. Santelises. So you mentioned that there is a new plan, right, in place to make sure when we talk about cultural equity in the school system that there is greater access and um, more frequent art experiences, right? So it's not stagnant and separated. Um, one question that I have though is when we have schools that are <laughs> struggling in ways outside of their art curriculum, right? Or outside of their experiences with art, they might be, you know, struggling in all sorts of ways with retention, you know, with issues with the school building itself, with all kinds of things. Art is typically seen as this sort of ancil ancillary, secondary kind of thought, like, if they don't get art, it's cool because they need to learn math. <laughs> they learn, they need to, they need their core studies, their reading, right? And so how do we ensure that art is not considered like a, 
an afterthought if we're if we're really trying to make sure there's cultural equity like if schools are have all these other issues like how does how does art really measure up to all the other things that some of our schools are really struggling with no i think it's a great question and a lot of that is really the fault of you know the education community in general that for years, you know, I remember when I first um, started teaching, first got into schooling and, you know, it was seen as expendable. Art was seen. And I think a lot of that is connected to budget shortfalls, right? When you have a budget shortfall, people go first for what they see as secondary, right? And then from there, there was kind of this false belief that, well, if you strip everything down to the core, to your point, then we'll actually get kids to focus. I think the good news is we have seen that doesn't work, right? So, so that whole mentality, that whole belief has been tipped upside down because we stripped the schools of the arts. The reading scores didn't get better. There weren't more young people going to college. The attendance did not increase, right? And I think that we are in a period in education period where, for example, the brain science has really helped. The brain science has really helped in this because now, you know, a lot of times people feel like, well, you just make, you know, it, they think of, well, art makes, you know, students feel good. Well, now we have brain science that actually backs up what I'm sure artists knew for forever, but now is backed up in the science that says, actually, Art helps young people learn to read. Art helps young people learn math more deeply. And so even at just a fundamental scientific you know, analysis, we have more evidence in that area. I think the second piece is that within Baltimore City, our focus on wholeness came from what I heard from families, what I heard from young people themselves, you know, when I first came back to Baltimore um, five years ago, it was so clear that, you know, young people were like, look, we are more than just this number, our reading score on a page, right? And that there are other parts of us. And art really is a space to bring that out. And, and so I think the good news is there is a real understanding now that art is not a nice to have, Art is an essential. And what we're also seeing is that over the last 14, 15 months of the multiple traumas, right? The multiple pandemics, right? Like we've, we've had a, you know, a racial pandemic alongside a medical pandemic. And what that means is that there are lots of young people, lots of adults who are hurting. And when we are having, you know, and this should be uplifting for, you know, the black creatives who are tuned in, I've got to tell you, when we've talked about how we bring young people back to school, when we've talked about what is going to get young people to connect again, right, not just to, uh, you know, math and reading, but what's going to get them to connect uh, through a mental health frame, through an emotional wellness frame, a lot of what comes up is the power of the art. So I would say this is this is a very different time in education, a very different time in Baltimore City for the acknowledgement that art is now essential. And so it's not really the case making that it's had to be. And I remember two years ago testifying before the Maryland State Legislature when we were really along with you know, community activists with parents and students advocating for additional funding for Baltimore City Public Schools. And I remember a legislator asked me, well, what would you do with all the extra money, right? Because, you know, oftentimes people feel like, oh, you must be wasting it or something. By the way, we have had numerous audits, numerous studies have said that's not the issue, right? That it has actually been underfunding. But I do think that what we, what I said that day has has rung true. And what I said is, I absolutely know what I would do with that money. I would make sure that every young person in Baltimore City had some early exposure to instrumental music, right? And that's where, you know, if you if you look at the great African-American musicians and Black musicians and artists, they, a lot of them learned at school first. And so you'll see in our new buildings, our 21st century buildings, we now have spaces for music. 
spaces for arts. And so when people ask, what would you do with the extra money in a funding formula? That's what I say. I say, go to our 21st century schools, see, have more arts opportunity. So I actually think it's a good time to make the push. And I don't think the case making is as hard as it was say 20 years ago. Okay, so I'm very quick follow up because I saw a question from Chelsea uh, Monet. Given that we're, we're coming from um, a time when there were there, <laughs> the expectation was that schools could, should have 0.5 art teachers or, or trying to get us to one whole, right? art teacher. We're talking about money. There, there has to be like just more funding to achieve this reality. So where is this money coming from? I, I don't want to just dream. Where, where's the money coming from? So I think the good news is that um, because of the advocacy, we have more money coming through the Kerwin legislation, right? So I think all that push that the community did has resulted in what I call, you know, part A. And now, you know, it's spread out over a number of years, but we had, you know, our our legislators uh, really pushed to keep Kerwin in spite of the governor's veto. And so that's initial good news. And the thing about that money is it's long-term. The other good news, although I have to remind people it's one-time money, right? And so one-time money, goes away, right? And I know, you know, I know Madam Smith knows this as well, right? That we have um, unprecedented one-time federal investment in schools. And so that gets back to what I referenced earlier, that that's why we're doing listening within the community. Like what do, what do we need to put in place? It doesn't mean we can hire another 500 people because the money's going away, right. but it does mean we can be strategic. So we're not all the way there, but we are much further than we were when I became CEO in, in five years ago. Sounds good. All right, Jackie, we gonna try to, I, I, I know I didn't give you your, your, your targeted question, so I have one for you. And then we're gonna use our, our remaining time to get our last um, couple of questions from social media. I'm going to ask us to keep these answers concise so we can get to as many of our questions as we can. But Jackie, the question that I have for you is that, okay, so over the years, right, BOPA has brought all kinds of new cultural activities and festivals to the person. While there's accompanying public critique that BOPA does not do enough to support and represent Baltimore's black population. What is BOPA's response to this? As an organization that is um, to, survive, to provide supports for the entire city, the citywide events that we do are reflective of that. So we do have an artscape, we do have uh, fireworks, New Year's Eve, we have 4th of July, we have the uh, Martin Luther King parade that we still produce for the city we have for 25 years. So that specifically is for um, the black community per se, it's for the city, but focusing on, of course, um, that community. I would like to think that all the events that BOPA, the large scale events I'm speaking specifically about now, that BOPA produces is for the city. Um, and within those events, trying to highlight and support venues um, of artists of color, um, black owned businesses, that's a part of what we do, making sure that those people are represented behind the scenes as well in front of the scenes. Um, they, the city does produce their own events, AFRAM, that's produced by the city, it's not produced by BOPA. Um, but we would like to think that we have been representative of the city. Now, as far as not representing the city, do you mean in terms of large scale events? Like that's that's what you mean? Like not enough of large scale events for the black community? I won't speak on behalf of everybody. That's not my thing. But I, I think to your point, a lot of people don't know all of the work that BOPA does. Um, they are more so aware of the large scale things that they've seen, right? The things that you've mentioned. So we can tailor this to, to specifically the larger scale events, yes. For large scale events that we produce for the city, there's one that's specifically focused with the black community in mind, which is the Martin Luther King Jr. Parade, which we still produce this year, although it was virtual, um, we still were committed to doing something for the community because we know how beloved that it is. Uh, we are in conversations now with the city about future planning, what that looks like. Um, so we can always go deeper and get bigger and better. Like there's never a, a time where Bobo will um, 
we're always open to criticism, feedback, and conversation. You know, so the program that we do specifically tied to the city is for the city. And we're hoping that it's affecting and for everyone, um, but also keeping in mind that the people that we're employing, um, we are working with the MBEs, the WBEs, to make sure that they are a part of the process and making that come to life for Baltimore City. Thank you so much. All right. All right. So we have 10 minutes left for questions. So again, we're going to try to keep it concise. Uh, let's see our first question. So from Changa, Dr. Santelises, what is BCPS? What is we B, what is BCPS willingness to make space available for art-based activities and how is access to that space standardized? So quick question, uh, quick answer for that is I would say. One, our community schools, um, some of the new 21st century schools um, have built in community space. I will say there is, there is an approval process just because we've got to make sure that we have mutual accountability for the space. But if you call our operations office, you can get more information about how you can reserve some of that space. Was that quick enough? That was very quick. Thank you. I love it. All right, next question is, is Rex and Parks open to grant partnering opportunities? Yeah, so right now we currently have um, a, a park and play grant that offers up to $5,000 for community groups. It is a smaller program, so we don't have um, a, a lot of grant opportunities currently. That doesn't mean it, it won't become available, um, but I think that the way to get in our spaces, similar to the question that you just asked uh, Dr. St. is that we're here, right? And we are, are very good partners with the school system, right? So if a school space is not available, then you can always see if a rec space is available. So I do think that um, there's synergy in knowing that we're one city, these are, we're all serving the same population. So uh, oftentimes you get to one dead end, you kind of give up, but like if the school isn't available, see if a rec and parks uh, space is available. So we do have limited grant opportunities that are available. Um, that information again is available on our website, but as those opportunities grow, our social channels are where we'll be advertising those things. Thank you. All right, our next question. How can we increase the city's, oh no, we already, we already asked this question. Sorry, was that all of our questions? Okay, so y'all was too quick. That was like rapid fire. I am so appreciative. All right, um, so I don't have any other questions, but what I will say is, do you all have any final remarks that you would like to make to Baltimore's creative community that is listening right now, especially those black creatives who, you know, they're looking to push the conversation forward about how can they plug in, get the resources and, and, and do the work of being amazing creatives that absolutely make Baltimore a more culturally vibrant and just, beautiful place, right? To visit, to live, um, and to express themselves. So what, what final comments would you like to leave our creative community with? Um, we can start with Jackie from Boca. Great. I'll be trying to be super fast. Um, I would say communication is key. So as myself and my team are reaching out to specific Black creatives, organizations to find out how we can better partner and serve and understand and provide support, I would say reach back as well. If you have not heard from me specifically, if you have not heard from my team, send an email, ask a question, try to set up a meeting. Um, we'll make it happen. I mean, that's all that we do. So I think that communication goes both ways and we're super open to collaboration. Thank you so much. All right. Um, final thoughts. Let's go to Jacia from Recreation and Park. All right. Similar to Jackie, please reach out to uh, explore partnerships and what that can look like. Uh, we know that the Black arts artists in Baltimore are so plentiful in the variety of uh, things that are available. We want to make sure our young people particularly have access to that. So um, partnering with us will be uh, an amazing opportunity. And then also stay in tune to just the great things that Rec and Parks is going to be putting on. So AFRAM, there will be announcements soon about AFRAM 2021, which is a great space where we showcase uh, Black culture, particularly with the emphasis on the arts. So uh, to stay tuned to different things that are happening in communities and where you see yourself fitting in to that conversation, 
please invite us. Please come talk to us um, so that we can make sure we are nurturing and growing the next generation of Black creatives in Baltimore, but also giving a space for our existing artists to make sure we're telling the story, to make sure that um, you know this moment in time where there is a spotlight on Black culture doesn't pass us, right? We don't want it to be a fad, something that was happening during coronavirus, right? We want it to be our lived experience. And we start that by having the conversations now so that we have a sustainable program and process that we can feed into, we can grow, we can continue to tweak. Uh, so I think the biggest takeaway is one, stay tuned. Uh, Rec and Parks, again, we are we are on the rise. You will see us um, in every space of the city. Um, big news coming about Afrin and our different spaces opening up. But partner, we want to be a reflective and responsive uh, to our community. We want to make sure that we're not just limited to athletics, right? Recreation is much more diverse than that. All of our students don't want to roll out a basketball, right? So for those who want to create, those who never know they, they were creatives, we want to make sure that we are uh, really sewing into the next generation of Black creatives. So please partner with us. Follow us on social media. You can find us on Instagram at Beckett Parks. And our website is www.bcrp.baltimorecity.gov. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Dr. Santelises. No, thank you very much. And I will continue the theme of communication. Uh, please, for any Black creatives that uh, want to get connected to what City Schools is doing in the arts, Chanel Howard is our fabulous head of arts for City Schools. She really has begun moving the needle. If you feel like you hit a roadblock because Yes, we are a large organization. And like Jacia said earlier, we too are working on improved customer service. So if you feel like you hit a roadblock, feel free to reach out to Karen Lawrence, who is the CEO's ombudsman and say, hey, you know, what's going on? I couldn't get through. And Karen will also help shepherd you. And then really want to emphasize uh, the community meetings that will be happening throughout the month of May in each legislative district we are going to. Um, all sections of the city, not just saying, come on up to North Avenue, we will be out. And it would be fabulous to hear the ideas, reflections from the Black creative community um, around what educational recovery looks like for our young people. We're not even calling it recovery. We're calling it reconnect. We're calling it reimagine, right? Like how do we actually um, really recover, but also move forward. So we would love to have a Black creative representation in those community meetings. If you need information about that, you can also go to the City Schools website. Although unlike Jackie and Jacia, uh, I am uh, a, a slower learner. And so I have not memorized after all this time, uh, which part of City Schools website this is in. But if you go to our website, you will see the connections. But thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. So I just want to take a second and just say, Dr. Santelises, thank you for the work you're doing in leading Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, Jacia, thank you for your work as Chief of Staff with Recreation and Parks. And last but not least, Jackie Downs. You know, I love you. Thank you for your work with BOPA as the Art Council Director. I really appreciate you all for taking the time um, sitting on this panel for participating in the Black Artist Fair, uh, powered by Comcast. And I, I just want to say, uh, I, I hope that we can work together in the future um, and make more opportunities, especially for Black creatives to connect with your agencies as we continue to make Baltimore a better place. So I bid you all adieu, um, and I'm going to close out our panel. All right. So I just want to say again, thank you all for listening um, to our conversation with the city. Um, you know, this was a great panel and I hope that you learned some things. I hope that you are able to connect with these city agencies to work with them in, in whatever regard that helps to move your creative practice forward. Um, we have another round of panels and workshops starting soon. So please, please, please make sure you go to our website or go to our social media to make sure you can get the links to those upcoming workshops and 
panels. I also want to invite you to join us for Do More Baltimore's Grand Slam tonight at 6 p.m. We talked about those kind of organizations that work with teaching artists. Do More Baltimore is one of those organizations, um, literary teaching artists, slam poets, spoken word poets, working with young people all across Baltimore City, and they are going to have a competition tonight where we are going to crown um, a new Grand Slam Poetry Youth Champion. So y'all make sure y'all tune in 6 p.m. on Facebook with do more Baltimore, do more spelled D E W M O R E. We are also going to have a DJ exhibition celebrating Baltimore's club music with DJ Ducky and DJ Black Star at 7 p.m. right here on StreamYard. We have posted a survey link in um, on our Instagram page at Official Black Arts District in our link tree. It is also on the screen here. Please, please, please take a second fill out the survey, tell us what you thought of the panel, tell us what you're thinking so far. We wanna make sure this is bigger and better next year and we can't do that without your feedback. So please fill out our survey. We really do appreciate it. And again, thank you so much for listening. I'm Lady Brian. I'll see you later. <laughs>